Today, we begin the series, message one, entitled, Jesus and the Joy of Drinking. And I do want to start by reiterating that I am afraid to preach on this topic and have felt more anxiety and trepidation, like I said earlier about this message and series, I think because this is a ubiquitous topic that everybody has an opinion on. All of us know somebody who's gone over the top or been hurt by alcohol, and many of us, I'm sure, have an experience of such beauty and goodness there. But I've got more anxiety over the last three days than in the last three years about a sermon. And it's the questions that are haunting me. How can you preach about the joy of drinking when booze has caused so much damage in so many lives? I know people, uh, an acquaintance who a month and a bit ago got killed by a drunk driver at the corner of Sarcy Trail and Richmond Road. I've counseled and come alongside families whose lives have been significantly scarred and in some cases ruined by alcohol. And I've witnessed so many boneheaded decisions in my life alone, let alone the lives of people that I hang with. Why? Somebody wrote a comment on the blog which really gets at the angst of the questioning. Anonymous, I have to be honest, the writer writes, I've never really made the connection between God and alcohol or really considered it as a gift from Him. Appreciated as I do sometimes, I often have a bit of an internal conflict when it comes to alcohol. I have seen too clearly the damage it can cause. Like any good thing, I suppose, we people in general have a capacity to grant this, to grant it this unwarranted power in our lives. There is a wonderful aspect to alcohol. A beautiful wine can be just so perfect with a wonderful meal, with with its ability to warm your soul a bit and bring this calm, or an ice-cold beer after a day of yard work under the sun or a perfectly blended margarita overlooking an ocean sunset. There's something about not only the flavors, but even that little bit of a buzz that you can just kind of melt into. I sometimes try to imagine when I'm drinking a perfect wine what it would feel like to break bread and sip a dark red wine or even a bubbly white wine with my friend, Jesus, and it always makes me kind of smile. And for that, I have this rather holy appreciation for alcohol. But dot, dot, dot. I've also walked close to that place of really needing it and using it as a crutch to see me through a stressful day or to numb me to something that I don't feel like facing. I've seen people I love and care about unable to control how much they drink, and I've seen how ugly it can be. I've walked in on people passed out in the middle of the day because they couldn't or wouldn't stop drinking. I've watched grown men make fools of themselves and young men almost kill themselves and actually, at times, successfully kill others. I've seen love turn to hate, wisdom turn to folly, brilliance become obscured. I've seen young women lose their dignity, their security, and their innocence because of it. And for that, I have this very holy loathing towards alcohol. It's a conundrum. And so I ask myself this week, why glorify it at all or give it any kind of biblical sanction? And why bring it into the church? And my answer, and the answer hopefully over the next couple of weeks as you think about it and we talk about it here, is we bring it into the church in order to somebody prayed this morning, reclaim it. And I wrote in my notes, in order to redeem it, to look at the gift of alcohol anew, and in particular, to look at it from a God's eye view. And the hope is that we can reframe and redefine alcohol and understand it more as a gift of God distill some new meanings that work from another direction 
in terms of helping us live in balance and in a God-honoring way as we imbibe. Over this past century in North America, and particularly south of the 49th parallel, some Christians who were parts of some churches took a very strong stand in, during periods of time to shut down all alcohol consumption, the prohibition and temperance movements. And today we try to legislate, control drinking from sort of the outside by gating it in or bridling it with minimum age require, requirements or maximum blood alcohol levels for driving or with socially accepted norms about how much you drink at lunch when you're working downtown and, or whether or not you drink in front of the kids. Or... So when it comes to controlling booze, drinking, we, we legislate, we create rules around it, which is a good thing because I am who I am, and sometimes rules are what I need to stop me from being a bonehead. You are, we are, what we are as human beings. Legislating and rules are one thing around the issue of alcohol, but they're not the only thing. And sometimes rules backfire. I read this week that during Prohibition down in the States, 50,000 Americans died drinking more. Alcohol consumption rates went up between 20 and 30 percent during prohibition periods. And because it was so unavailable, people were drinking unsafe forms of alcohol, and up to 50,000 either died or were blinded by the other forms of alcohol they were drinking. I hear stories of kids who leave good Christian homes and maybe haven't been given a worldview around alcohol or a balanced view around the gift of alcohol, who get to university and dive into the pub culture. They've never been taught what God would have to say about the drink, so we ought to talk about what God says about the drink. When I was 13, 14, Grade 9 in high school, Clarkson Secondary School, 2,000 students, didn't know anybody, but I met Pat Finelli, you know, first class, sat beside him. And a week or so later, Pat said, come on over to my place for lunch. He was just up Playford, you know, 10 houses, so we went to his place for lunch. And Pat says, would you like some wine with your sandwich? <laughs> I'm 14, and my reaction is, yeah, you know. I shouldn't have said yeah, because it was like homemade Italian wine. And it, not, not that homemade Italian wine is a problem but this was not good. Um, but I wanted to drink it because, yeah, I drink during lunch when I go to grade nine in high school, you know? And I had this, drinking wasn't hugely prohibited in our house, but it was never talked about, especially whether it was good or bad. And I think it was assumed that if you were underage, it wasn't good. <laughs> so I'm drinking my two glasses of wine at lunch with Pat Finelli, and I'm thinking I'm sinning royally, but loving it. And Pat just has one glass, and he drinks it like he would have always drank it with his family at lunch, because culturally they drink wine with their meals, right? And he had this really healthy view of drinking this glass of wine at lunch, and I had this totally other view, which somehow for me in that moment made me drink two and sleep through English all afternoon. In Italy this spring, Fran and I were stunned and maybe we shouldn't have been that shocked, but when we were having lunch one day, and we saw this a couple of times, but one day in particular, somebody left over half a bottle of white wine on the table, and they just left and went back to work um, in Siena. And I thought, that is a healthy view of wine, to be able to do that. All our sin laws get the price of booze up so high, we feel we have to finish the bottle. I wonder if it really does help us drink less. Okay, we need rules, yes. But I also think we need to address this from the inside and God, get a proper, healthy, God-made-this-world-and-made-all-things worldview, a bit of a heavenly worldview of alcohol. 